Oh, so, thank you, Fred Watson, for taking the time out to uh, interview for UNSW Physics. Um, so, I'd like to uh, ask you with a fairly simple question. Uh, what inspired you to take up astronomy? Well, it's a long story. How long have you got? <laughs> as long as you have, really. So, um, uh, it's really uh, to do with when I grew up, uh, which was not that long after the Second World War. I mean, I was at school in the late 1950s and early 60s. And at that time, there was a kind of general feeling that there was going to be another world war and that it would be very much uh, fought on the grounds of science and technology. And so science was absolutely in the ascendancy at that time. Uh, the school I went to, there were, there were three science streams and one art stream. Uh, and it hasn't been like that for a long time. Uh, so uh, very much, uh, you know, we were, the cohort that I was in, we were all engaged with science. But more than that, it was the beginning of the space age. Uh, Sputnik 1, the first uh, successful Earth satellite, launched on the 4th of October 1957. Uh, I can remember that. I can remember the, the news reports about listening to this strange Russian object going overhead and beeping its signals down to the radio. Uh, quite exciting stuff. There was a lot of really good science fiction as well. I was um, totally enamoured with a guy called Dan Dare. Dan Dare, pilot of the future, uh, who was in a comic called The Eagle, which was iconic in Britain in the 1950s. And we all read Dan Dare and loved him. And, uh, a new scientist started in 1956 or 7, I think. Um, it was a TV programme called The Sky at Night, an astronomy programme, started in 1957. So it was all, you know, the, the, the stars aligned, if I can put it that way. And, and I was completely caught up in the idea of space and astronomy when I was a school kid, as were all my friends. We were all, you know, we, we played space, we thought space, we read space, we dreamt space. And then gradually uh, my friends and classmates kind of grew up and became more sensible and went on to become doctors and engineers and, um, and, and other people of a more useful nature, but I just never grew up. So I, uh, I, I can remember actually when I decided that I wanted to do astronomy as a career, it was after an eclipse in 1961, <laughs> total eclipse of the sun, which I read about and thought, I'd love to do all this stuff. And that was it. Oh, it's wow. been downhill ever since. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say that. <laughs> yeah. It's actually been quite fruitful well, for you, I would imagine. Yeah. Yeah. So which university did you go to to study astronomy? Uh, that, yeah, I went um, to the University of St Andrews in Scotland because uh, back in those days, uh, there were only four universities in the UK, of course I grew up in the UK, there were only f four universities in the UK that did astronomy as a first degree and three of them were in Scotland and the other one was University College London who wouldn't have me for some reason, probably because I came from the north of England which is why. Can't, can't have people from there, you know, in our university down in the south. Uh, but in Scotland, uh, they kind of welcomed me with open arms. I got three offers of places from nice. three Scottish universities and, and went to St Andrews, which I never regretted. St Andrews is uh, a delightful town, a small coastal town in Scotland, formerly the capital of Scotland. It has Scotland's oldest university. It was founded in 1413, just celebrated its uh, 600th birthday. Um, and I went there to study astronomy, but in the end I, I did maths and physics. Um, I actually went back there as well. I left in, uh, uh, after my first degree, worked for two years in industry, actually building large telescopes, so I was an optical physicist. Whereabouts was that? In Newcastle on Tyne. I worked for a firm called Sir Howard Grubb Parsons and Company Limited, which is no longer... Sounds famous. fancy. <laughs> yeah, it was. And they, they actually built the telescopes that we use at Siding Spring, the Anglo-Australian telescope, the biggest telescope in Australia and the United Kingdom, <coughs> Schmidt Telescope. So I worked there for a couple of years, then went back to St Andrews to do a master's, which was on research into asteroid orbit. So I went from instruments to asteroids and then worked on the planets in uh, the Royal Greenwich Observatory down in the south of England. Uh, then I went up to Edinburgh to work on the orbits of stars in the galaxy. Uh, so the horizons were steadily getting bigger and eventually came to Australia. So what made you come to Australia? Was it because of the telescope? Yeah. Yeah. So um, I worked for the Royal Observatory Edinburgh uh, in the early, sorry, the late 70s. Uh, actually I was working for them until 
the mid-90s, but for 10 years of that time I was on secondment here in Australia. Royal Observatory Edinburgh ran a telescope, uh, the United Kingdom Schmidt Telescope. It's a wide-angle telescope uh, that uh, at that time was taking photographs of the night sky. That's basically what they did. It was a survey. And uh, it was operated from Edinburgh, so I came out as a staff member in 1982. Um, but my head was full of ideas about using fibre optics in astronomy, which was a very new thing in the early 1980s. And with a guy called Peter Gray, who worked for the Anglo-Australian Telescope, which is a neighbour of the UK Schmidt Telescope, uh, together we kind of pioneered the use of fibre optics in astronomy. Um, subsequently, the Schmidt Telescope became part of the what was then the Anglo-Australian Observatory. So the two telescopes were united in one organisation, uh, as they still are, except we're now called the Australian Astronomical Observatory. Yes. All right, cool. So as well as having, obviously, a stellar career, dare I say. <laughs> Sorry, I had to say. Um, but you've also been uh, noted as a popular scientist. In other words, you've done a, written, obviously, a lot of your books here, um, <laughs> lots of them, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, so what sort of, what's your drive behind writing these books? I guess what inspires me to write books is other books that other people have written. <laughs> um, I, I should be a little bit more cogent than that. I mean, ever since I was at school that we were just talking about, I was an avid reader and was inspired by a lot of what children's authors and then subsequently went on to read books by Patrick Moore and all the, the great names in popular astronomy. And it, it was always a, an ambition to, to write something uh, about astronomy. Uh, but before that, I guess I felt a strong engagement with the public. Um, when I was at the Royal Greenwich Observatory, I often found myself on the end of a phone answering questions, inquiries from the public, just because I quite enjoyed it and wanted to let people know. And as time went on, this turned into a bit of a passion. And really the driving motivation originally was the fact that um, I'm in a job doing something I really enjoy, but, it, but I'm being paid for by taxpayers because I've worked in effectively a public service. And so it is incumbent on me as an astronomer to, to try and get some of this knowledge that we're gathering back to the general public who are footing the bill. And I've actually felt that uh, always that all astronomers should carry this around with them, this motivation to give something back to the community that supports them. Because most astronomers are paid out of the public purse, whether it's in uh, national observatories or universities or wherever. And so that really became quite a passion. And um, the other thing is that I quite like people. In fact, I like people as much as I like stars and planets. Uh, and I think the engagement of wanting to talk to people and to engage with them and, and tell them about what we're doing. And in fact now that's really recognised because when research grants are given then uh, an element of those grants has to go towards the outreach component, in other words telling people about what the research means, why, you know, why um, researchers are interested in things happening uh, thousands of millions of light years away which could never have a direct influence on human life but there are good reasons for doing it uh, in terms of our understanding of the universe at large and perhaps the way it drives technology to to introduce things like digital cameras which originally came from astronomy so that's um, I, th I think uh, now very much uh, more a part of the researchers daily uh, their daily tasks to be aware of the fact that they're going to have to talk to the public about this at some stage. Do you think scientists are actually motivated to speak to the public or do you think it's also a, uh, a funding issue as well? Um, I think scientists are far more motivated now to speak to the public than they used to be. Um, when I was working at the Royal Observatory in Edinburgh, which is where I really started doing a lot of outreach work, um, uh, a lot of my colleagues thought I was a complete nutcase because I liked talking to people and they just wanted to sit in their ivory towers and do their research and really there was not that much pressure on researchers in those days to, to, to tell the story, tell, tell people about what they're doing. Uh, whereas uh, now that pressure is there but I think scientists recognise that actually it's quite a lot of fun trying to boil down your detailed research into um, a few sentences that people can understand. 
guys. Mm -hmm. So if you actually had a very long career, if you actually went back to your 16 year old self, would you ever sort of consider a different career path? Uh, <laughs> there was a time, uh, I think the answer to your question is no, but there was a time uh, when I was a part-time muser as well, uh, because in the 60s and 70s I did a lot of um, musical endeavours. The, the folk boom was kind of in hand then. There was something called the folk revival which took place in the 60s and 70s, principally in the UK, but also in the USA and in Australia too. Uh, and anybody uh, who had a guitar um, was fair game to go around folk clubs and try and impress people. And I had a few heroes in the folk world and worked very hard to try and emulate their playing and actually became not a bad guitarist. Um, uh, but I didn't have anything like a decent voice, but that didn't count in those days. It was all the, the guitar work, the fingerstyle guitar work that everybody was impressed with. There were a few uh, basic numbers that if you learned them, you could walk into any folk club and if you could play them, you were, you know, people would listen to you. So, um, so I did that uh, quite wholeheartedly for some time. And in fact, um, in the early 70s, used it to support my master's degree which was kind of grinding along, uh, mostly by teaching. I actually did a lot of guitar teaching and that helped. The gigs didn't. You know, you'd earn a pound or five pounds if you're lucky. But it did get me in, into the company of a lot of people who later went on to be very well known. So uh, I was half of a band uh, which was called the Bradford and East Fife Ready Mix Concrete Company. Uh, the, the, the other half of the Bradford and East Fife Ready Mix Concrete Company is still playing. He still works in, uh, in Scotland. Kenny Brill, great, great musician. So, but we were often in competition with another band uh, which was called the Humble Bums. Uh, humble Bum is a Scottish word for a bumblebee. Ah. So the Humble Bums had a very short name and we thought that's why they got all the gigs. Uh, however, the Humble Bums were Jerry Rafferty who had huge hits in the 1980s. Uh, Baker Street was his big hit. It was a, probably a number one uh, throughout the world and became very famous. Very, very talented musician. And uh, Jerry's offsider was a guy called Billy Connolly. Uh, I don't know what happened to him, but he... Uh, <laughs> no, actually, Billy was... Um, be, be, just within these four walls, Billy was never the, the most impressive musician. But of course, the patter was what got the humble bumps through. So you met Billy Connell? Uh, I, I competed with him. We were on the same stage. <laughs> we were trying to outdo them, these humble bums. Yeah, yeah. It's, um, it was, but you know, uh, there were other people like that. A um, guy called John Martin. Uh, uh, Kenny and I were once the warm up act for him. He became a very big name. Um, and. Um, Barbara Dixon, she was very well known in the 1970s as well. So it was a bit of a, a kind of a, a fertile area, a, 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 almost a nursery for these people who later went on to become great names in, in the folk and rock uh, world. Uh, I kind of realised that I'd, since I wasn't getting the gigs, maybe you did need to be a better singer than I was and slightly more imaginative in your songwriting. I did a lot of songwriting, but it was basically just taking ideas from other people and moulding them into a Fred Watson genre. Subsequently, later on, um, I did uh, decide that, yes, there was, a, there was a, a vehicle for me to use the singing and the playing in science outreach. And uh, um, there are, if you troll the web for Fred Watson singing uh, the blues, you can find me doing the Galaxy Redshift blues and things of that sort. I might have to link it in this video. You should link it, yeah. Uh, what would be even better would be to tell you that in uh, 2008 uh, we made a CD, uh, which is still available <laughs> for free. <laughs> Um, it's actually got 10 of my science songs on it and, and 10 excerpts. All from your songs that you wrote. Yeah, 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 wow. yeah. And there's other songs as well that are not quite so science-y. Uh, but they, are, they very much owe their origins to that period in the 60s and 70s when there was all this new stuff going on. It's not new anymore, it's a bit hackneyed. But yeah, cheered me up. So, you've got sort of a diverse career then, you're sort of an yeah. astronomer. Uh, yes, that's right. So, but um, the... the the, to return to your question, the bottom line is that I think 
even though I wasn't the world's most brilliant astronomer by any stretch of the imagination, I was actually a better astronomer than I was a musician. So it's probably the right choice. But that would have been the alternative career. And I would have been, yeah, I don't know where I would have been now. Most of the guys who, uh, who I've just mentioned, with um, very few exceptions, are no longer with us. They kind of smoked and drank their way to an early grave. Ah, well, that's the rock and roll life, I guess. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, cool. Well, that's an interesting part of you. <laughs> I, kn I knew you played an instrument. I didn't yeah. realise you actually uh, had a band and wrote yeah, a lot we of were, songs. Yeah, we, we, we could, you know, we did okay. In those days, there, w there wasn't the same vehicles that there are now for recording and putting your stuff out there. We, I mean, nowadays it would have all been out on YouTube and things like that. Yeah, because it's so much easier. I mean, just setting up video cameras yeah, here is right. just so easy. I wouldn't yeah. do this. I couldn't do this. 15 years you ago so easily right. so because yeah, exactly. the editing software nowadays I guess that's another sort of question since you've seen the technology back in the day and technology is today mm. can you comment on sort of where you think the technology is going to go yeah well it's come a long way uh, and I, I, I mean do you mean the technology of music or the technology of astronomy oh, or I both, guess a bit of both <laughs> actually oh, mine, yeah. yeah one of my sons uh, is uh, a person who writes music himself, but he does it all on, a, on an iPad, on a tablet. You know, he sort of, he doesn't play an instrument. Actually, he did used to play violin, so he's got an idea of the rudiments of music. But he can sit on, a, on his tablet and put together what sounds like an orchestra. Uh, he works with a guitarist, actually, and together they've made quite a few albums, which are also available on the web. So that, that technology is just, it's just blown away. You know, it's, it's so different from what it was like in the early days when you had a, a tape recorder on somebody's kitchen table and you were trying to make it sound like, a, like an album. Um, <coughs> where it's going in the future, who knows? Uh, synth synthesis, which is what you're doing on a, on a tablet, you're synthesizing music, uh, has just come along by leaps and bounds since it started. Uh, I've got a, a, a little, um, it's actually I digitized it, but it was a, a, a seven inch, uh, uh, LP, if you can call it that, 7-inch LP, because it ran at 33 and a third RPM, uh, which was basically giving, uh, this was made in the 70s, it gives you an up-to-date snapshot of what the best of synthesized music was like then, and basically it's crap. It just sounds like rubbish, you know, when you listen to it now against what people can do um, uh, now. Um, your, one of your colleagues at UNSW, Joe Wolf, uh, who's a music music, uh, well he's, he's a professor of acoustics but he's a music uh, specialist as well, he writes music. I listened to an overture of his that was totally synthesized and you'd ha ha be hard pressed to tell the difference between that and a real, a real orchestra. Wow. So, so that's all, uh, you know, come a long way and it's clearly going to go further, there'll be more of the same, new ways of introducing sound into the experience. Um, surround sound I guess is all still very much something that's developing. I hope I'm here in 20 years to, to, to listen to all that. Uh, going back to astronomy though, um, so your question, how has the technology Im uh, improved what we know about the universe and where is it going? Um, that's in many ways a much easier one to answer uh, because I've seen the way the technology has evolved. When I started working in astronomy, uh, the, really the principal way of detecting images was by photography. You had photographic plates uh, which were hypersensitized to make them more sensitive uh, and processed in such a way that they had their maximum sensitivity. However, they still only responded to at best three or four percent of the light that fell on them. Uh, the rest of it was just wasted. And throughout the 1970s and 80s, uh, there was the development of electronic detectors, the kind of devices that are in uh, cameras now. We call them CCDs, charge couple devices. And they have efficiencies that allow them to record 95% of the light that falls on them. So they're much more sensitive in terms of their response to, to the faint light of astronomical objects. So that has transformed astronomy. And it's why we now see images from amateur astronomers with small telescopes that rival what we were doing with the Anglo-Australian telescope, the biggest telescope in, in Australia back in the 70s and 80s. That's one thing. Other technologies have improved as well and I mentioned a minute ago that I was involved very much with the infancy of fibre optics in astronomy and that's um, 
transformed the way we gather data on large numbers of objects. So what fiber optics allow you to do is to look at the, the detailed spectral signature of a target uh, that's using the barcode of information that you get when you spread its light into a rainbow. And that gives you the intimate details of a star or a planet or a galaxy. But we can now do that rather than doing it one at a time as we did when I started in the science of astronomy, we can do it hundreds at a time because of this trick of using fibre optics. And what that's meant is that we can now do surveys of objects uh, of a particular class, whether it's stars, galaxies, um, quasars for example, we can survey them uh, hundreds of thousands at a time. So um, I've been involved with actually two major surveys which have used the UK Schmidt telescope. Uh, one we measured something like 150,000 galaxies. We've also just recently completed a survey of half a million stars using this equipment. And there's more of the same on its way. We're, we're actually changing the technology of uh, the UK Schmidt telescope to look at two surveys down the track, which will be a million objects each. So the, perhaps I can give you a specific example of how this technology has evolved and how it's evolving in the future. Uh, when, you, when you form an image with a telescope, it might be this size, and what you've got is basically a, a picture of the sky. Now, the old-fashioned way was to put a photographic plate there and record it. But what we now do is put optical fibers on all the targets that we're interested in. So maybe four or five hundred, could even be a thousand optical fibers, selecting individual targets and then taking the light away to break it up into its spectrum. And so you're looking at all those objects simultaneously. Now the trick is that you have to position these fibers with an accuracy of a hundredth of a millimeter. So you can't just plonk them down anywhere. And so what we've used in the past is robots to do this. And the robots basically position the fibers one at a time. So it positions one, does it with the next one, on average five or six seconds per fiber. And so that's quite a long process. Uh, and the robot is a, basically a mechanical arm that lets you do this. But the new technology that is uh, still being perfected but will be actually in action next year, um, that has each fiber having its own micro robot. We call them star bugs. They're little devices that move the fiber to where you want it, position it to, a, um, to that accuracy, a hundredth of a millimeter, and then leave it there until you, you want to move it. And the, the great thing is that you can have one robot per fiber, so you, you can move them all simultaneously. So there isn't this sort of dead time as the, you know, as, as Can the, you actually the, see the little bugs crawling yeah, around? Yeah, you it? can, yeah. We've got footage of that oh, stuff. Oh, right. Which, that'd be cool to be, see. Yeah. You're not afraid to swat. Oh, that's a bug there you want to get No, no, you don't do that. No, it's, it's all in a, whoops, it's all in a very, uh, <laughs> a very um, um, a sterile environment. You know, you, this is all happening inside the telescope. But this is, this is a result of the expertise that we have among our technologists at the Australian Astronomical Observatory. I have to say that the AAO, Australian Astronomical Observatory, has really led the way on the world stage in pioneering this technology, both with the sort of pick place robots, as they're called, which move individual fibres around, and now this new Starbucks technology. It's very much associated with the AAO, and what it means is that other observatories throughout the world who might well have bigger telescopes than the one that we run they beat a pathway to our door because they know that we have the expertise in making this stuff. And it's perhaps one of Australia's least known and least appreciated hidden exports because we're exporting this stuff overseas. It doesn't rake in billions of dollars, but it certainly raises Australia's prestige in terms of its scientific, um, you know, the scientific knowledge that people have of what we do here in Australia. So what's your current role at the AAO? That is a very good question. A very, very good question. So um, I think my title is still Astronomer in Charge because I used to be based in Coonabarabra and, and had a group of my scientists and, and techos who worked uh, under my management. But um, pretty well everybody who worked for me has now retired or moved on to other things. So I'm not actually in charge of anything. So um, maybe the name is now... Uh, slightly <laughs> a misnomer. But I do have another title, uh, which is, uh, I mean, really I'm, I'm now an astronomer at the Australian Astronomical Observatory rather than being astronomer in charge. But I'm also head of lighting and environment. And what that means is that I have to spend quite a lot of my 
uh, working time, uh, ensuring that the observatory skies remain unpolluted by light pollution, they remain dark. Uh, and that's actually quite a big job because, as you'll appreciate, uh, development moves on. Uh, we have a site uh, at Siding Spring Mountain near Coonabarabran, which was chosen because of the good atmospheric conditions, but also because it was well away uh, from city lights and, and communities that could send a light plume into the sky and spoil our dark skies. So um, back in the uh, late 1980s, uh, a colleague of mine, a former colleague, John Doerr pioneered uh, the idea of using um, planning regulations to protect the night sky. And that is still in place. We have legal instruments that actually um, prevent unruly development. I mean, we're not against development, but what we don't want is development that's going to shine a lot of light into the sky. And so there are uh, environmental planning policies that people have to follow if they're within certain distances of the observatory, in fact out to 100 kilometres from the observatory. But uh, those uh, regulations change with time, they're not set in stone and as governments change, state governments in particular, then their ideas on planning change and the planning departments have to move in response to that and that means that I've got to keep up with all this. So I chair a little committee called the Siding Spring uh, Dark Skies Committee and we have members from the Department of Planning, from local government authorities. We have a lighting specialist, Reg Wilson, who sits on that committee. And our job is to monitor developments and ensure that the, the, the regulations are in place that will actually protect the observatory's night sky. Um, one really exciting part of that, and a lot of that is taking place from within this room, is that we are uh, currently starting a bid to have Australia's first internationally recognised dark sky park um, uh, basically set up in, uh, in the vicinity of the observatory. Uh, the observatory, whilst it's not in it, is surrounded by the Warrumbungle National Park, which is a beautiful area of the Warrumbungle Mountains, absolutely stunning um, natural region. And it's very fitting that that should be Australia's first internationally recognised dark sky park because the observatory is there and we already have the regulations in place, we already have the infrastructure there to, to, to make sure that the skies are protected. So that is now a very big part of my job. Involves liaising with planning departments, with local government, with the resources companies because a lot of resources companies are looking at that area with regard to coal extraction and gas extraction and so I talk with these companies as well. Uh, light um, really uh, can be used in a way that is detrimental to astronomy. So uh, light pollution is one of the evils of our modern world. It's something that's quite unnecessary. We now have the technology to certainly to reduce it. We won't be able to eliminate it altogether, but to reduce it. And um, uh, the thought that I will leave people with, I hope, perhaps one of the great legacy outcomes from the International Year of Light might be darkness, because we will have uh, better dark skies because of greater use of technology in, in urban lighting. Cool. Well, thank you very much, Fred Watson, for taking the time to chat with me. It was been, certainly been enlightening. And oh, awesome. <laughs> sorry. <hope> it's not done. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Thanks very much, Shane. Okay. It's great to talk to you. Thank, thank you. you.